Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. Who's glad to be here so far? Um, buckle up is all I got to say. It's going to be a fun ride today. You can have a seat and uh, just high five, fist bump, whatever makes you comfortable, your neighbor ne- next to you. Um, today, I'm gonna, who's ever been like, you've been in a, like in a situation in life and you feel like God's speaking through you, like God's using you, and then life continues and life happens, and then you figure out that God wasn't so, so much as, yes, maybe he was speaking through you, but he was also preparing you for something, and you didn't really know the fight that was coming, obviously, because you're not God, you don't, and then the fight comes, and you're like, oh, praise God that you're good and gracious and awesome, and I've, you've been preparing me for this, and I'm ready for the fight that's here now, so that's where I'm at um, in my life right now, me and Molly, so <clears throat> this message today, it got, this is a continuation, the wrap up this series my dad's been in, and it'll be on emotional control, and my dad gave me this probably, I don't know, a couple, two, three, four weeks ago. And he gave me this message. He was like, hey, you're going to do this on this date. And I was like, yes, sir. Awesome. And he he um, did a message on it back in like 2014. And then I was, so I'm listening to that message. I'm studying on emotional control, studying scriptures, doing this whole thing. And then uh, a week ago, some stuff pops off in mine and Molly's life. And uh, we start going full force into an attack against, uh, attack from the Jezebel spirit. And we're fighting that, and we're going through it, and all the attacks that come with it. <clears throat> and I thought all the things that we had been, you know, preaching at youth, and the message that I was writing for you guys today, and all that stuff was for the youth students and for y'all. And then next thing I know, I'm like, oh, let me pull up all these messages I have saved on my computer and, like, preach to myself for a second. Like, let me remind myself of the things that I've been telling people about God's goodness and who he is. So that's where we're at in our life, and this message is not just for you guys as much as it is for me and my family as well. So <clears throat> before we get into it, I'm going to pray and we'll jump into it. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Thank you for what it's done in my life and my wife's life already, God, with what we've been walking through. I pray that if there's anybody in this room that is also going through a battle and also going through a struggle, but is doing it for your kingdom and standing firm in your truth and in your righteousness, God, I just pray that this message penetrates their heart and their mind and builds them up and gives them courage and hope just as it did me and my wife. So it's in your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so who knows when you're in, when you, who's ever been in a fight? Let's start there. Anybody ever been in a fight before? Okay, so Matt Durbin, I got you. You know what's up. Uh, A few of you guys. I um, used to take jujitsu, and then I tore my knee for like the hundredth time it felt like at jujitsu. So I was like, you know what? I'm not a professional fighter. I'm done. So I stopped. But when I was there, there, uh, the guy who owns the gym, his name's Brandon, we're going against him, or I'm rolling against him, and jiu-jitsu is like, you know, like almost like ground karate. I don't know. If you never don't know what jiu-jitsu is, it's like locks and holds and stuff, and you just roll around. It looks a little weird if you don't know the sport. You just, it's like two grown men rolling around on the floor. A little sus, but anyways. So we're like, we're, we're doing jiu-jitsu, and Brandon probably weighs maybe like 150 pounds, 160. A lot smaller than me. At the time, I was 230, and this guy's like, 152, 1, 150, 160, and we're uh, rolling, and he gets me in this thing called a triangle, which basically means his legs are wrapped around my head and arm, and I'm like this, and he's like choking me, but he's really good. He owns a gym. He's like one of the best in the world, and he, so he's got my other arm pinned back, so I have no way of escape. I'm just standing there, and I was like, maybe I can crush him with my body weight because I'm really big. At the, t- you know, at the time, I was bigger than I am now, so I like stand up with my legs and like dive into him like I'm like I'm diving in I'm going deep and so I'm like diving into this guy trying my best and he's you know he's just chilling he don't care and he's just slowly like a triangle is like when you put your leg like this basically and I'm imagine me in this hole and so I'm like don't I'm not supposed to fit and I don't fit and I can't breathe and so I'm like slowly losing breath but he's he has these mind games he likes to play so he kind of loosens it up a little bit where I can breathe but I'm I'm a fighter so And sometimes I do it incorrectly. So, and when you're in a war, you have two options. You can slow your breathing down and go, okay, what's the next right move here? Let's just stay under control. Or you can just lose your mind and just start going crazy. And this is, this is the guys that are in the street and they're like, dude, I black out and I just, nobody can stop me. False. You will get slept in a gym. If you go and try to black out against like Sean Strickland or Conor McGregor, you will die. Like there is no blackouts going to save you. And so leading up to this point, I kind of went black. And I was like, I'm just going to powerhouse Brandon and throw him around. He's real small. And because I went black and wasn't about my senses, 
He got me in a triangle, and he's laughing at me, and he's holding me there in this hole. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm like stuck, and he leaves me a little gap. And so then he just kind of looks at me, and his eyes are so peaceful. It's almost like, I don't even know. It's like looking into like a baby angel. Like that's how sweet it is. Like I don't even know if those exist. Like I don't even know if that's real, but that's how I felt. I was like, this is like, and he's just cradling, cradling me between his legs. I'm like, wow, this is like, should be not fun, but something about this is magic. And so I'm just like standing there looking into his eyes and he's so peaceful. And then again, I have no arms, like this arm's behind my back pinned, this arm's stuck and I'm, I can't breathe. He has two arms. So he takes one of his hands and he puts it over my mouth like this. And I'm like, mm, 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 mm. and they're like, what, what are, you know, I have like literally like this, I'm like, no, no, and it's not going anywhere. And so I'm like, please, Lord help me. And so, so then I'm like, calm down. Calm down. So I look back into his eyes. Again, my baby angel eyes of Brandon. And I'm looking into him. Peace. And then so I'm just like, thank you, God, for the peace of Brandon that I can steal real quick. And so I'm looking at him. And then he takes his other hand and he just does this. So now, now I'm like, and I'm like, all I got is one nostril. And I don't know if you've ever been in like a, a really intense workout, but it's for me, at least it, I get real snotty. It's really gross. It's like, you know, it's, it kind of, kind of makes me feel manly, but it's like snot's going everywhere, and I'm like, like trying to huff and puff. Like I'm trying to do something, but I'm like, bro, you gotta. I'm talking to myself. I'm like, bro, you gotta calm down. You got to chill out. So I'm like trying to slow my breathing, and my heart's like, like going crazy. And so, I just look back into my baby, my baby angel Brandon eyes, and I'm like, okay, he's peaceful. He knows something that I don't know. Maybe I'm not gonna die, but right now it feels like I'm gonna die. So I just sit there, and I'm like, okay. What's the next thing I can do? If he's giving me, because Brandon's a teacher, and so he always gives you, usually, I won't say always, usually he gives you a way of escape. If you can calm yourself down and you can go, okay, he's trying to teach me something here. What is he trying to teach me? Is there a way of escape that I'm, that because I'm losing it, I'm not aware of, but if I'll just slow my breathing down, even though I'm only breathing out of one nostril and I'm just like, mm, 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 I like, is there a way out? And so I just calm myself down and I'm like, okay, there's a small gap in between my neck. Again, I'm like, in this hole, and there's a small gap in here. So I'm like, if I can fit my hand in here and posture up how I'm supposed to do, I'll create some space and he'll lose the, you know, lose. He's giving me a way of escape, but like lose the hold. And I do that, I get out, he laughs, and he's like, good job, and then like arm bars me or something, and I tap and I die. So it's like, whatever. But he like, he gives me the way of escape out of that, but I had to calm myself and bring myself back to reality and go, okay, am I panicking and making this worse for myself, or if I just calm down and just stay under control and breathe, is he trying to teach me something here and I can learn from this? And, but it all, it's all about me. Like, can I, can I stay under emotional control in this moment? So this is where me and Molly have found ourselves in this week. Um, we had some things happen and we ha- we're presented with the opportunity to lose emotional control and panic and get choked out and lose the battle. Or we can stay under emotional control and go, okay. What's the next right thing to do? Because I'm not, sometimes if the, if the battle's heavy enough, I'm not even worried about, like, when I'm rolling with Brandon, I'm not necessarily worried about, hey, I got to take your back. No, I just don't want you to break my neck. Like, I'll get, what, forget about the back, forget about tapping you. I just don't want to die right now. So sometimes you're in the battle, it's just about, can I just get past this moment? So we're in the, we're in the heat of this, and just in the same sense, In that moment, I had to look into Brandon's sweet little baby angel eyes and, like, steal some hope from him and go, okay, he knows something I don't know. He knows it's going to be okay. We FaceTimed my parents this week, and they're uh, they're actually in Austin, Texas. I think they're online. I love you, Mom. love you, Dad. And um, so they're in Austin, Texas, and we FaceTime them. And we didn't FaceTime them to really get advice. We just FaceTimed them because sometimes you just want to talk about things other than what you're going through. You're like, I just need to hear something else. Like, just tell me a different song. And so we FaceTime them. They're like, yeah, we're staying here in this, uh, <clears throat> they're, at, they're like staying in this nicer hotel thing. They're staying in it and they show us, well here, because we've all been here, it's been pouring down rain and storming, which is like, I don't know why that happens when life gets hard, like automatically Satan's like, and thunder. And I'm like, golly, man. And so it's like raining and it's like extra, you know, espresso depresso mode over here. And I'm like, what is happening? And so we FaceTime them and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, tell me what's been going on. They're like, well, we've been eating this food. We like, went to these places and like look how pretty it is and they show me and it like 
for me, that was another moment where I'm like, can I steal some hope from you guys? Like, because if you get trapped in Decatur, sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, like it smells like cat food and it's raining. All life is over. And it's like, I don't know what to do. And then I look, I'm like, okay, well, at least it's sunny in Austin, Texas, and they're eating good food. So like, so I literally imagine myself eating the food they're eating, sitting on their balcony, looking at the sunshine, taking in the green fields that were around them and like, okay, life will get better. And what we're going through is worth it. What's the next right thing for me to do? And um, in that, I was reminded that this church, the reason that all of us go under attack, not just me and Molly, that we're all in this fight together, is because we're rebuilding something that's been broken for a long time in this city. We're rebuilding what a faith family looks like. We're rebuilding the house of God in a true and correct way. We're rebuilding a lot of things that were torn down for a long time, specifically in this city. And when you rebuild something, there's going to be some opposition. There's going to be an attack. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Nehemiah 4, and we're going to be in Nehemiah 4, 4. But the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, were, uh, they're written in like sequence with each other and together. <clears throat> and there's one main problem we see in these books, and it's that God's people struggle to maintain their identity as God's people as they faced internal and external pressure. And I believe that's, what ha- that's what's happening in the city, is that there's a bunch of people in the city, especially in the South. We can expand it beyond Decatur. In the South, where because we're Christian and we grew up in the church, that I can gossip, act a certain way, and do all these forms of ungodliness, but I'll slap the, word, the label Christian on top of it, and it's okay. And it's not okay. It's still sin. And there's God's people in the city who I believe are legitimately saved and legitimately love the Lord, but you're struggling with your identity of God's people. That when people look at you and you go about life, that is there really a difference between you and a lost person? Or are you struggling with your identity of God's people and God's children? And that's what's happening in, uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah. So I'm going to read through this, and as I read through it, I'm going to take out some points that help me along the way and then wrap it up. So Nehemiah 4.4. Again, I don't speak... Uh, Hebrew, so I don't know how to pronounce these names all the way. But when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria and said, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, indeed, even if a fox climbed up what they are building, it would break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah injects here and says, listen, our God, for we are despised. Make their insults return on their own heads and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have angered the, angered the builders. So the first thing we see, and in this I'm going to talk about how Nehemiah's men remained faithful and stayed under emotional control and continued to build the wall. Because a lot of times, if you're me, I read scripture and I immediately become like the Superman. I'm like, oh, I'm Nehemiah. But oftentimes in life, I'm not the Nehemiah. I'm just the guy that's like, like I'm just a part, like I'm just a, a random character in the story. I'm the men that don't get mentioned. Like the people that are like, hey, I'm just out here doing the right thing and following somebody's lead and trying to follow God. Like that's what I'm doing. And, but we focus on like, oh, I have to be Nehemiah. I have to be David. I have to be this. And it's like, yes, you can take truths from them too. But in this story, we're going to look at how did Nehemiah's men stay under emotional control, and in the opposition, continue to build the wall, continue to stay faithful in what they were called to do. So one, Nehemiah's men had someone who was praying for them. Nehemiah is praying for his men. When the, when the slander, when the opposition comes, Nehemiah's men know at least we have Nehemiah that's praying for us. So who in your life, when the opposition, opposition comes and you're seeking the Lord and his ways and his kingdom, who is actually praying for you and you know is praying for you? Like, <clears throat> legitimately, I just got prayed over twice before this service started. And I've had people pray over me throughout the week. And there's been people who reach out that maybe didn't verbally pray over me, but they text me like, hey, just so you know, I'm praying for you specifically in this moment. So who in your life, when the opposition comes, you don't just wonder and hope, well, I hope they're praying for me, but you can reach out and go, no, 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 I know that JP's praying for me. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had the will to keep working. When Sembelet, Tobiah, and the Arabs, Amorites, and Ashdodites heard that the repair to the walls of Jerusalem were progressing, 
and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw them into confusion. So they're mad that the work's continuing, so they're going to come, you know, try to whoop them up. Not in God's terms, but whatever. So when we pray to our God, <clears throat> oh, so we pray to our God and station the guard between, or because of, wait, oh, my mind's. So we pray to our God and station the guard because of them night and day. So point two here is Nehemiah's men joined in prayer and went on guard. So it's not just a, hey, Will, are you praying for me? Also, I know the power of prayer. Do you believe in the power of prayer in your life? I know that people are praying for me, and now I'm going to join in on prayer, and we're all going to pray to see God's fruition happen in this in this moment, not in, I'm not praying like, oh, in 10 years and 15 years. No, no, no. In this moment, we're all praying that God comes through right now and I'm on guard and there's some bodily action of some steps that I need to take. It's not just a, hey, God, (sighs) do something. It's no, no, no. I'm praying, do something, but I'm, I'm also going to take some bodily action and there's going to be some stuff to be done as well. And Judah, it was said, the strength of the laborer fails since there is so much rubble. We will never be able to rebuild the wall. That's what they're saying in Judah. And our enemies said, they won't realize it until we are among them and can kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who live nearby arrived, they said to us time and again, everywhere you turn, they attack us. So I, Nehemiah, stationed people behind the lowest sections of the wall at the vulnerable areas. How did Nehemiah's men stay under emotional control and continue to build the wall? They allowed wisdom to teach them where they're vulnerable. Who in your life are you allowing to tell you where you're vulnerable? Because I know if I'm in the fight, I can get a little like puffed up and go, no, I ain't vulnerable nowhere. Well, now I'm vulnerable in my arrogance. And I need somebody to go, hey, 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 that's, we ain't doing that. Or I'll go, oh, poor pitiful me. And I'll start going into depression or I'll let anxiety come up or I'll let this come up and that come up. And those are the places I'm vulnerable, but it feels right to me. So it doesn't feel like I'm, you know, I can succumb to the attack here. So I need an outside eye to look in and go, hey, hey, Josh, you're vulnerable here. So who in your life are you allowing to teach you where you're vulnerable? Next, he says, I stationed them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. So four, they came into unity as families. And the whole family was in unity on guard for the attack. Spouses, are you actually in unity with your significant other? Are you in unity, husbands, with your wives? Wives, are you in unity with your husbands? Children, are you in unity with your parents? When the attack comes, oftentimes we separate and go, no, I'm going to go journal on my own. I'm going to go read the word of God on my own, and you go do it by yourself, and we'll be okay. But what me and Molly have found is true power comes when we're both on our knees this week. Like, mine was so jumbled up couldn't work, came downstairs, locked the door to the green room, turned on worship music, and sat in there for almost an hour on our knees praying, in unity as a family, in unity when I'm putting Vivi down. She might not know what's going on, but we're all praying together. In unity, Pastor JP's praying over me because he's like my second dad. In unity, Barnett's praying over me as my brother in Christ. Are you in unity with your family? They go, no, no, I'm not just trying to do these things by myself, but I'm coming together. And then it goes on in 14 to say, after I made an inspection, so five, Nehemiah inspected what was expected of his men. Who are you allowing to inspect your life? Who are you allowing when the fight comes to go, okay, you're supposed to be doing all these things, but are you actually doing them? Because me and Molly, we're not arrogant. We don't go, no, 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 like nobody needs to know. No, I need you to know that I'm doing these. And I want you to ask. And I want you to make sure that what I'm saying and the actions that I'm taking are right and are biblical. Because I want you to inspect what God expects of me. And I need somebody of authority to go, hey, hey, you're under attack. And sometimes when you're under attack, what seems right is not always right. And so I'm just going to watch and make sure that what you're doing is okay, and I'm going to be a voice of wisdom in your life. So who is a voice of wisdom in your life? 
I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord and fight for your countrymen, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Six, Nehemiah's men allowed their perspective to be flipped. Are you addicted to the story you've been telling yourself? Are you addicted to the pain that you've been in? Are you addicted to the trauma? Are you addicted to the fight? And you're like, no, I always want to be in the struggle. Or do you allow a voice of reason to come in and go, hey, 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 remember who you serve. The battle's already won. The victory's already been had. Pull up Hebrews. Read about the hall of faith. Did God not do all that? Will he not continue to do even more? And you go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Flip my perspective. Rewrite my story because I'm having trouble rewriting it myself. When our enemies heard, this is 15, when our enemies heard that we knew their scheme and that God had frustrated it, every one of us returned to his own work on the wall. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half held spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers supported all the people of Judah who were rebuilding the wall. The laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held, worked with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Each of the builders had his own sword strapped around his waist whilst he was building. And the one who sounded the ram's horn was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is enormous and spread out, and we are separated. And he goes on, and you can read the rest. <clears throat> so the last two ways that Nehemiah's men remained under emotional control and were able to stay in the fight and continue their work at the same time, seven is they remained, pre they remained prepared for work and for battle. I don't get to just go, well... Life got hard this week, so now I get to stop being a dad. Now I get to stop being a husband. Life got hard this week, so now the fruit of the Spirit, I've been patient long enough. I've been loving long enough. I've been kind long enough. I've acted in righteousness long enough. I get a, I get a moment to lose my cool. I don't, I don't get that. I'm going to do the work God has called me to do, and I'm going to be ready for battle and prepared, knowing that the battle's going to come. And since I know the battle's going to come, I'm ready. I know who God is. I know who my God is. I know who I serve. I can stay in the fight. But just because I'm in the fight doesn't give me a reason to stop the work. I'm still doing and being who God's called me to be, which is his son. And eight, <clears throat> this is a constant throughout this chapter. It's not explicitly said. But they were submitted to God's word and to someone in authority. This is the theme throughout the whole thing that I'm trying to get you guys to see. Are, who, in times of battle, in times of distress, in times when opposition comes, who are you submitting yourself to in your life to that you can go, yes, I'm submitted to the word of God, but also sometimes I can read scripture through the lens of hurt and I can see and read what I want to see and read. So I need someone to tell me, no, 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 this is, this is what this means, this is what this says, and I, I, I need somebody to check me sometimes. And I need someone to guide me. So who is checking you and guiding you in times of opposition when the pressures hit? They go, hey, hey, just follow me as I follow Christ because, like, hey, Barnett, I need to follow you as you follow Christ because right now I don't know my next move. Hey, Brandon, I'm about to get choked out. I'm just going to look at you and still a little hope and know that you're teaching me something in this moment and there is a way of escape. So for me and Molly, what does this practically look like <clears throat> and for you guys in life? One, we know it's not about you. Like it's not about me, it's not about Molly, and it's not about you when we go through hard things. It's about the legacy that we're living, that we're leaving, and that legacy won't come easy. It's about your children and your children's children. When the devil looks at you, he doesn't look and go, oh, I'm coming after John. No, I want John's kids, and I want John's kids' kids. And I want to ruin every seed that you have and that you will ever have that will come after you. And if I can do that, I'll take out generations. But too many times we take it personal and go, no, no, it's, a, it's an attack on me. And it's not even about you. My life is about the kingdom of God and serving him and following in his ways so that generations after me can enjoy him forever. Second, <clears throat> I know that I have a faith family around me who I can call on anytime and anywhere, and I actually do it. 
I'm not just like, oh, I'm a pastor, so I can't call on him. No, I'm a pastor, so I better call on him. No, I'm like a son of God, so I better do what the Bible says and know that I can't do life alone. In the Bible, fun fact for you, the word saint is never used in the singular term. It's always plural. Saints with an S. I think there's twice that it's used without an S. But it's still used in the context of the plural. Meaning, we're, we as Christ followers were never designed to do life alone, and God never references us as, as a single person. Elijah, when he is running in fear from Jezebel, and he's like, I'm all alone, there's nobody here. And God's like, okay, take a nap, eat a cake, wake up. Also, there's 5,000 other people. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm not all by myself. <clears throat> Three, I stack my God's wins. I, I don't stack and get arrogant and go, well, these are the things that I've done. No, 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 I stack my God's wins because those wins go for all of eternity. Those wins go longer than just, you know, 25 years. And those wins are perfect. So I stack my God's wins. I read through Hebrews, and I, I literally go back into Hebrews when times get hard, and I read about the Hall of Faith, and I remind myself of the people. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, <clears throat> enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war put foreign <clears throat> armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins and sheep and goats. Um, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. My favorite movie. Who's ever seen the movie 300? Anybody? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I know a lot of people have, like, life mottos. And they're like, this is my life motto. I have a movie life motto because I'm a movie guy. So I just, like, watch movies. I'm like, that's my movie life motto. And a little long, but it's okay. So the movie 300 is my life motto. And, you know, it's like, it takes a man to pull out a man. And so I go watch Leonidas, and I'm like, freaking Leonidas, bro. I'm like, dude. When I was little, I used to watch Leonidas. And I'm like, I'm going to look just like that dude one day. I didn't make it, but, you know, maybe with some steroids and a little help, I can, I can get there. But my guy's ripped. Well, he's watching me like, that's my guy. And so I go back and watch 300 all the time, and I'm just like, the scene where he's, you know, they're like, this is for Spock. And he's like, and kicks him off the edge. But he, like, looks back at his wife, and his wife's like, I'm like, that's what it feels. If you saw my uh, post about Molly the other day, I literally posted, I was like, that's what it's like being married to my wife. I'm like, what should I do? And she's like. And I'm like, you, like, whatever. So anyways, there's this scene in um, King Xerxes. If you don't know anything about King Xerxes, give it up for my wife real quick. She's a baller. I love her. Um, so there's a scene in this movie where King Xerxes is, it's, it's at the end of the movie, and he's offering Le King Leonidas everything that he could want. He's like, you can keep Sparta. You can be the warlord of the earth. You can have riches. You can have literally everything that you're fighting for. I will give it to you, but it's in my name. And, and all you have to do is just bend the knee. Just bow down to me, acknowledge me as a God king, and you can stay king of Sparta and have everything that you want, but it'll be under, under my name, and you'll be like a little, a little subpart in that, but still having everything that you want. And so he's like, he offers him this, and uh, if you've never seen the movie, King Xerxes is like, I don't know, he's like 10 foot tall, he's freaking huge. And he like puts his hands on him, and his hands are like super long, it's kind of weird looking, but he like puts his hands on him. And Leonidas is standing there, and he's just telling him, he offers him all that, and Leonidas, like, walks out. And he's like, oh. but uh, the idea of kneeling. He, actually, I have it written down. This is what he says. I freaking love this quote. Let me read it real quick. I'm like, oh, my gosh, so sick. He says, he says but uh, he's like, the idea of kneeling. It's, uh, you see, slaughtering all those men of yours, well, it's left a nasty cramp in my leg. So kneeling it'll be hard for me. And then basically it's like, bro, I'm not kneeling to you. We've been whooping tail this whole time. Like, why would I kneel to you? And that's literally my motto when life gets hard and the enemy is like, hey, lose emotional control. Give up. Do this. Turn to this. Don't turn to God. You, and the enemy's like, you can have everything you'd ever want. It just has to be in my name. Just bend the knee. It'll be in my name, but you'll still have everything that you want. And I'm like, oh, you know, what about... Do you remember that guy Gideon? I don't know if you've heard of him. Maybe, I don't know. Barack, Samson, David, Samuel, prophets. 
all those, all those people in the Old Testament. You remember any, uh, Paul, Peter? You remember any of those? And, you know, I, in my mind, the devil's like, oh, God, here he goes again. And I'm like, I just don't know. Like, it just seems like my God's been kicking tail this whole time, buddy. Like, I don't know. Like, can you, can you show me one guy? Can you show me one guy? That's one. Can you show me one? Jesus? You ever heard of this guy? I don't know. I don't know. Let me tell you a story real quick. So he like came, lived a perfect life, and we were all messed up. We were all sinners. We didn't have anything going for us for real, and we were not in relationship with God at all, and we were cut off, and then he died, lived a perfect life, was a sacrifice for us, and then he actually went to your home, you know, like sin, grave, hell, the whole thing, death. I don't know if you heard of it. He goes there. He like takes the keys from you, like drop kicks you, whatever, goes back and is seated at the right hand of the Father because the work is done. I don't know if you ever remember in the Old Testament that the, that the, uh, the priest never actually got to sit down in the Old Testament because the work wasn't finished. So they had, to, they had to receive sacrifices day and night, and they never got to stop. But because Jesus said that the work is finished, he actually gets to be seated at the right hand of the Father because the work's done. So I don't know if you know it or not, but the idea of kneeling is kind of hard for me because the battle's already won, and we've been kicking tail this whole time. So just go back, Xerxes. Love you. And peace out. And that's... My idea, every time life gets hard, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, I need my wife. My wife, literally yesterday, I was going through it because I've had a ton of knee surgeries, and I, Pastor Amy was cooking us dinner and loving on us this week, and I was like, <clears throat> we were over there, and I literally just stood up, and my knee buckled, and I haven't been able to walk for two days, until this morning, and I was going to use a chair <clears throat> today, and because I couldn't, st- like, I literally would have to stand like this because my knee, like, I don't know what happened. It just buckled and it wasn't working. And I was going to use a chair, and then I woke up this morning, and I, before I got out of bed, I was like, I'm not using a chair. Like, <clears throat> I've given it enough to this. Again, like, I'm not bending the knee. Like, I'm standing on my business, on God's business. And <clears throat> so I got out of bed, and I was like, oh, my God, I can walk. I'm like, look at this, like walking around, I'm like, oh, well, hello, and Molly's like, are you okay, and I'm like, I am good, and so I was like doing my thing, but my wife has to, I'm not perfect at this, so yesterday, my knee's like messed up, it's hurting, I've been doing like everything I'm supposed to be doing for it, and for no apparent reason, it just gave out, and like buckled, and then just wouldn't allow me to walk on it, and so yesterday, uh, she knows I love donuts, so she takes me to Parlor Donuts in Huntsville, and we're on the way there, and we're driving, she's like, okay, look at me, I look at her, and these aren't hard smacks, so don't think, my wife's not abusive, but she's like, snap out of it, and I'm like, what the, what, and she's like, snap out of it, I'm like, snap out of what, she's like, I need my husband, and I'm like, I'm here, she's like, nope, snap out of it, and I was like, babe, she's like, last one, snap out of it, and I'm like, okay, we're good, and we like eat, you know, she buys me like a dozen donuts, and it was me, and Will and Ella, and the Van Fossens were all over there just cutting up, and I eat probably my weight in donuts, and ordered like two different specialty coffees because, you know, I'm a girl, whatever. I like, like my specialty drinks. So I like get all these coffees and not really a girl. I'm not that. But I'm uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh. so we get that. And then she's like, are you better now? And I'm like, yeah. And she, yeah, remember the guy who kicked? That's me. So, um, but she, I allow her to call me back into who I am because a wife needs her man. And, but she gave me a time. She gave me like, 12 minutes probably, and I was like, you know, I'll give you the time it takes you to walk from the church to the car, and you better be better, and I'm like, okay, so I'm like, as I'm walking to the car like this, I'm literally like, because I won't use crutches, and she's like, so, but she snaps me back out of it and calls back the man that she committed to follow, and then lastly, in this, me and Molly And my encouragement to you is to submit when you're in a time of battle and when you're on your knees and you don't know the next thing to do, submit everything that you do and everything that you have to an authority over you. For us, that's our, that's pastors on staff here and that's the elders here. We submit to them and we go, hey, hey, I don't know, I feel like this is the right thing. I've done my due diligence, my due diligence, I've studied scripture. Can you, can you approve of this? And can you make sure that I'm doing the right thing? Because I don't want to disqualify myself before God. It has nothing to do with them and their approval. It has everything to do with I'm a son of God and I want to follow him to the best of my ability in every season and every walk of life. And I know where I'm vulnerable because God's enlightened some of them to me and I've allowed people to tell me. And so I know I'm vulnerable in these areas. So can you make sure that in the areas that I'm vulnerable that I'm actually following the word of God? <clears throat> so that's what me and Molly do. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. So I want to be a church that 
is not filled with fools, that is not filled with people who want to do things by our own eyes, but want to follow God and do things his way, but that takes submission. And I know that's not a fun word. Like a lot of women make, a lot of women on social media make a lot about it, but I think there's a lot of men that hold the card of like, no, I'm, a, I'm the man of the house. You still need to be submitted to somebody. I'm, yes, I'm submitted to God's word, but there's also people in my life that I'm submitted to that have the yes and no vote in my life that can tell me that's, that's good, that's not good. And no, when I just need to, hey, you need to make this call on your own. <clears throat> but no, when sometimes I need somebody to make the call for me because I don't know the next right thing to do. So I asked um, Barnett, did Molly tell you? Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> actually, my wife did because I you know, was leaning on her for that. But <clears throat> Barnett's going to have the band come up and we're going to do another song. And uh, this song came on in preheat. <clears throat> And it's just, honestly, it's just really uplifting. And <clears throat> it's very reminding of who the God is that we serve, of what he's done, what he'll continue to do in our life if we'll let him and if we'll follow him in ways that don't seem right, don't seem easy, and to the world don't make any sense. <clears throat> if you want to be a people who don't bend the knee, the battle's going to come. And if you know anything about 300, uh, they didn't make it. <laughs> like It wasn't good. And in Hebrews, it talks about that those people didn't see the things that they were waiting for on this earth. That they went to somewhere better. That they were praying for things that Abraham was promised to have all these things, but he didn't see all of it on this earth. He went to heaven for something better, and then now from heaven's perspective, he gets to see it all. So you guys can stand to your feet, and they're going to sing this song. <clears throat> and honestly, this song is just as much for me as it is for some of you in here to remind us that we do serve a God that in your deepest, darkest battles, in the hardest parts of your life, in the times when you're faced with just bend the knee, just give up, just go back to the alcohol, just go back to the pills, just go back to the gossip, just go back to the slandering, just go back to the manipulation, just go back to the pornography, just go back to this, just go back to that. And you can fill in the blank of whatever your vice is that you allow the enemy to tempt you with that you fall into sin. You can fill in the blank for that. But at some point you have to go, okay, all of that sounds really good and really enticing. But the truth is, you've never won a battle, devil. You've never once held a victory. Even in the times when you thought you won, when Jesus was dead on the cross, and he was in the tomb, and the stone was covering it up, Even in the times when all the sky went black and you thought you won and you thought you held the victory, even then you lost. Honestly, you're just a loser. You just suck, devil. You didn't, you didn't got nothing. You have nothing for me. And there's no part of my life that I want to give to you, that I want to submit to you for anything on this earth that I will do things, even a glimpse of your way. Because I know who my God is. And I know that he's going to show up time and time and time and time and time and time and time again, just like he does for every generation. And I'm no different. So for you, as we sing this song, allow God to remind you of how good he is, how awesome he is, and how powerful he is, even in your darkest times. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for speaking to me and my wife and my church family in times when things get hard. Thank you for being a God who loves us, who hears our cries and meets us there. But more than that, thank you for being a God who is faithful, that has a track record of being a God who we can trust, a Father in heaven who is good, that we can run to, and say, even when I don't see it, I know that it will be so. I know that the good is coming. Amen.